Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture, we derived the solution of a partial differential equation governing the dynamics of a vibrating string of length L. So Y here tells us the displacement that's perpendicular at a particular position X along the string. And this equation tells us how the displacement evolves as a function of time. The string is fixed at the endpoints, and I should emphasize that a lot of approximations went into creating that equation. So any real vibrating string is going to have many more complicated effects. In particular, we've ignored damping here, so our string vibrates forever. Of course, any real guitar or piano or whatever will have decaying amplitude over time unless you somehow put more energy into it with something like an e -bow, or say you're using a violin bow on your guitar like Jimmy Page. Our solution to this wave equation is a sum of a whole bunch of harmonic frequencies. These harmonics are integer multiples of some fundamental frequency, a meganaut, where a meganaut here is in terms of radians per second. You would divide by 2 pi if you want to have that in hertz. And what's interesting about the wave equation is that these harmonics in time are coupled to this spatial mode structure that has a sinusoidal form. So we let G and V define the initial condition in terms of the position and the initial condition in terms of the velocity. So if we set the velocity initial condition to zero and set g to something, that corresponds to plucking the string. And g corresponds to the initial shape at t equals zero when the pick leaves the guitar string. And if we were to set g equal to zero and set v to something, that represents striking the string, say, with a piano hammer. So the weights on these sinusoids, this alpha k and the beta k, those are determined by our initial conditions. The initial condition on the position determines alpha k, and the initial condition on the velocity determines the beta k. So the question is, can we find alpha k and beta k from g and v if we're given g and v? Well, it turns out we can. The thing to note here is that this looks an awful lot like a Fourier series. And the reason it looks an awful lot like a Fourier series is because it's a Fourier series. It just happens to have a very particular form. So for odd periodic functions with period P, we have a Fourier series representation that looks like this. And conveniently, that's exactly the kind of form that we saw earlier, where G is our initial condition on position. By odd, we mean that g of minus x is equal to minus gx. So this is a function that's anti-symmetric. And by periodic with period p, we mean that gx is equal to gx plus p. So in electrical engineering, you're used to thinking about functions of time, but here it's a function of space. Now, if you had an even function, i.e. you didn't have this minus sign here, so you had a function that was symmetric instead of anti-symmetric, you would have a cosine here instead of a sine. And for a general formula, you could write this as a sum of sines and cosines, but here we just need the sign. Now, if you look this up on Wikipedia, you'll find a Fourier series analysis integral that says we can find the BK by integrating this function over one period. And the period's arbitrary, but it's particularly convenient to integrate from minus p over two to p over two. So you integrate this function times sine two pi k over p x. Now in electrical engineering, we're used to using complex exponentials in Fourier representations, but here it's really convenient to use sine. And in a math course or a physics course, having this sine cosine kind of representation is usually more common. Okay, now we have a string of length L that we said goes from zero to L. So the most convenient thing to do is to tack on an odd extension to this that goes down to minus L. So for something like our first harmonic, the string vibrates up and down something like this. And mathematically, we're tacking on this anti-symmetric extension. And we're just going to ignore it. 
even though the math would compute something there, we only care about what's happening between zero and L anyway. So what we're doing here is essentially saying that we're going to let the period P here be equal to 2L. And wow, that's a terrible looking arrow. Let me try to draw a better looking arrow here. It's for things like this, I should probably be using PowerPoint, but that's usually less fun. Okay, so let's play the replace stuff in the formula game. So the P's here are all going to be replaced with 2L. And if we do that, these two cancel, these twos cancel, these twos cancel, all the twos cancel. So I can get rid of the twos. And that L is kind of ugly, so let me fix that L. And there's another trick I can do here, which is to note that G and sine are both anti-symmetric functions. So let me think about the integral here. It's going from minus L to L. But for all of the negative x, well, I can imagine that a minus sign inside the sign pulls out in front of the sign, and a minus sign inside of the g pulls out in front of the g, and those two minus signs are going to cancel. So another trick that I can do here is to say, well, I can actually integrate from 0 to l and just double the integral. So I can stick a 2 up here. All right. So now I have my Fourier analysis integral formula for functions along the string from 0 to L.